Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, today we're going to talk about macroscopic systems and the parameters that are associated with those systems. So as uh, we've talked about with the introduction to this physical chemistry 2 introduction to physical chemistry 2 course, we're focusing more on the laboratory scale um, systems. And so these, from the atomic perspective or molecular perspective, contain an enormous number of uh, atoms or molecules. So approximately uh, Avogadro's number. So when we have systems uh, that are a collection of particles, which is what a system is, if we are on the laboratory scale, we refer to that as a macroscopic system. When we're on the atomic scale or molecular scale, so one or two or maybe even a hundred, a thousand uh, molecules, we would consider that a microscopic system. Somewhere in between, uh, so still a lot of molecules, but a lot less than Avogadro's number, that would be referred to as a mesoscopic system. So we focus primarily on macroscopic systems here. And um, we can think of the macroscopic system as being set in some kind of environment or also called also referred to as surroundings. So the system is whatever it is that we are interested in and then everything else is the surroundings. So that really is determined by the type of problem that we're working on. So let's say we had a beaker of water. The most likely thing that we're interested in is the water, not so much the beaker, the room air around it. So we would be wanting to talk about the properties of the water, it just happens to be contained in a beaker, uh, but the beaker would be considered part of the environment as long as uh, also the, the bench top and the air around the beaker. So the system is looking specifically at what it is that we are interested in. Now that could be um, uh, there could be some some choice there. So for example, we have ice and water. Well, we could be looking at the water, we could be looking at the ice, or we could be looking at the ice and water system. So uh, the system is partly defined by what it is you're looking, looking at. And everything else is considered the surroundings. All right, now there are certain types of systems, and we've talked about this already uh, in the context of uh, doing some of the work earlier in, in an earlier video. So I'll go through this fairly quickly, um, but uh, important to categorize. So we have an isolated system, and this is where there is no interaction with the, uh, between the system and surrounding. So it's as if the surroundings don't even exist. Now there are no um, isolated systems in reality, but what we're talking about here is a time scale thing. So if we've got uh, the time scale of the experiment, there's no exchange of particles or energy, then we can treat that as an isolated system. The only true isolated system is the entire universe. There's nothing else beyond the universe or that can interact with the universe in any way. And so the universe is it. That's all there is. And so that's the only true isolated system. Now, if we were talking about, say, water, water in a thermos uh, on the time scale of a, a, a few hours. The thermos um, will prevent any kind of heat flow in and out, uh, so there'll be no heat energy exchange and there'll be no particles coming in and out of the thermos as long as we keep it capped and we don't drink any of the water. Now, if we were to look at that thermos over the course of a month, well then that is not an isolated system. Energy finally does leak out of the thermos no matter how good a thermos uh, we have. So again, it's a time scale thing to determine whether it's a, an isolated system. Um, and so to a very good approximation, if we were doing an experiment on that water or wondering about the properties of that water and the course of that experiment was 30 minutes or an hour, then uh, it's an isolated system. All right, closed system, uh, that would be like a bottle of water. So with, with, with it's capped, so we don't drink any of the water. None of the water will come out, none will evaporate out, but um, certainly if we hold it in our hands, heat from our hands will go into the water bottle. 
there's a there is a closed system that um, is uh, has a, one more uh, criteria, and that is that um, there's no exchange of heat energy, and um, this is a system that could do some work, uh, but it cannot uh, exchange heat with the environment. So it could work on the environment, the environment could work on it, so there would be an interaction with the environment. It's closed, there's no material that's leaving or coming in, uh, but uh, it's otherwise insulated. So uh, no exchange of, um, heat, of uh, heat energy. And then finally, we have open system that would be like the water bottle opened, so energy can come in uh, and water can come in and out of the bottle. All right, well, when we have systems, uh, we talk about what are called system parameters. These are also called system properties and system variables. And they're all really the same, uh, just the words we use kind of depends on the setting that we're in. So if we're describing the physical nature of something, we'll often refer to these as properties. So the property of this material is it has this heat capacity, it's at this temperature, and so on. Um, when we're talking about um, more mathematical aspects of it, we might be referring to these as variables. So um, as we get further on, and even in this course, we'll see some things called um, equations of state. So the equations, the relating these um, properties together in an equation. So often you'll hear uh, them referred to as variables. So a uh, temperature as a variable or pressure as a variable in an equation. And likewise, we might hear that um, as a parameter uh, in, a, in an equation. So uh, parameters, properties, variables in this setting uh, tend to mean the same thing. Now, of course, in, in a math setting, a parameter is definitely different than a, a variable, but um, that's just something to keep in mind as, we, as you read about these things. All right, so uh, the first scheme is to categorize parameters as internal or external. So an internal parameter is determined solely by uh, what, what's within the system. And so example here would be like temperature, internal, energy, heat capacity, internal pressure. Um, external parameters are determined by the surroundings. So this could be um, external pressure, that's an important one. Uh, so P external, um, an external field. So the voltage across uh, a capacitor like we learned about last lecture um, would be an external parameter. Notice here there's um, we see this P external. We talked last time about generalized um, forces and generalized um, displacements. So work is this, what we call the really fancy A, D, fancy little a, the um, generalized force is an external parameter and the generalized displacement internal. And I was, we were a little loose, I was a little loose last time, and um, so the pressure volume work, for example, is P external dV, is the, is the definition of that generalized force, gen that generalized displacement. Now, oftentimes, if we are um, in a near equilibrium situation, then the internal pressure is equal to the external pressure, and that's what we uh, often work with. But um, technically, when we set up a generalized force, generalized displacement, uh, we have an external parameter as the generalized force and an internal parameter as the generalized displacement. 
All right, uh, another aspect of this is when heat is exchanged, then only internal parameters are changed. When work is exchanged, then um, external parameters can change. Uh, and so if we have, say, a closed container and some heat is coming in or out, we, we, can, we can change the temperature of that um, system. Uh, now that, and, and, and that's changing only the internal parameters. If we have a case where, say, we are doing some work to, say, charge the capacitor uh, that we talked about last time, uh, then we are changing an external field and we're changing some external parameters as well. In a general process, then both of these can change. So if we do some work, we can also exchange some heat as well. So internal and external parameters uh, can, can certainly change simultaneously. All right, now let's talk about a second scheme, scheme two, uh, which is intensive versus extensive. So what you want to do is, is get this idea out of your mind now and, and shift gears to another way of categorizing these um, properties, because something that's intensive could be uh, external and so on. So there's a different scheme of categorizing things. So intensive parameters do not depend on the amount of material that you have, and extensive parameters do. And what I like to do is say, let's say we've got this block of iron. Or anything else. And then in our minds, if we can cut this right, and, and not affect anything in, the, in, in doing this cut, and then we have the two pieces, does the parameter change or not? And so one example of this is if this was at, let's say this was at a temperature of uh, 300 Kelvin, right, then if we can just snap our fingers and cut this in half, these will both be at 300 Kelvin, and there isn't a change in temperature there. And so uh, T would not depend on the amount of material, so temperature would be intensive. Temperature would be intensive. But what about volume? Well, of course, if we cut this, then this piece I should have been a little more clear. Cut this, look at one of the pieces. Uh, the piece here would be half the volume, let's say if we cut it right in half. So volume is extensive. And now the if you, if you imagine wanting to have a big database of properties of materials or you know a big um, CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, if you've seen one of those. Uh, we want to collect these properties, but we want to collect the intensive properties because we don't have to tell everybody how much we have all the time. So the intensive properties are what we want to collect. That doesn't mean the extensive properties aren't very useful, but what we want to do is ultimately be able to describe things in terms of intensive properties. The good thing is that all of these intensive properties are always linear in the amount. So if you double, they double. If you cut in half, they cut in half. And so there's the same dependence on amount for all of the extensive parameters. So if we take the ratio of an extensive to an extensive, parameter, we'll get an intensive parameter. And so we can always make intensive parameters. And this is very often done either dividing by volume, or dividing by number of moles, or dividing by mass. And so let's see a couple of examples here. Uh, let's take this volume here. So if we take volume divided by uh, number of moles, we get something called molar volume. Uh, we could, certainly could have taken number of moles uh, divided by 
um, volume, and then we would get molarity or concentration there. Um, we could take mass and divide by number of moles, then we get molar mass. Uh, we take volume, divide by, uh, sorry, let's uh, take, uh, let's take um, mass, divide by volume, we get density. And so we can make all these different um, intensive properties. If we divide by moles, we usually call this molar, so molar volume, molar entropy, molar um, specific heat, uh, molar heat capacity. If we divide by mass, we usually call that specific, so uh, specific heat capacity, uh, specific volume, something like that. Um, and so uh, a lot of the properties that you've heard of uh, are often ratios of extensive properties to make an intensive property. All right, so that's this uh, rather brief video about uh, these macroscopic systems. Not really any homework for this too much. Just tell yourself the story of this. Uh, remind yourself of the different categories of uh, systems. And uh, this is a good way to keep things straight when we start talking about the relationship between the system parameters, um, internal to the system, and then external to the environment.